Hey. You're only working 40 hours a week. You're a lazy man. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Hayden Outbound Podcast. I'm Philip. I'm Shane. I'm Chester. Chester's joining us today. He's a good friend of ours and a hard worker. And he's got a lot of experience in that realm. And we're going to talk about work from long ago all the way up to today. Some tales that we've experienced with that and have a blast. So y'all hang in there. It's going to be a great show. You told me one time that you ran a telephone line. Didn't you tell me that a long way? Oh, yeah. Yeah. A mile. 5,200 feet. You ran your own telephone line. When when, uh, I came back from Vietnam... Well, when me and my wife and I got married, we built up our own high rock. And you don't know it, but that, it's like a horseshoe. That road mm-hmm. goes around High Rock Mountain. Mm-hmm. In the center of that mountain, Birmingham on the west side is AT&T or Bell South at the time. On the other side was Blunstle Telephone Company. And we were on, we referred to that as the poor side. I don't know if y'all know that or not. <laughs> this side is the rich side that y'all live on. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, Everywhere we called, our children were going to Hayden School. Our doctors long were distance. in Birmingham. Everything was long distance. Yep. No $350, $400 phone bill. Mm-hmm. I actually. And that's a lot back then. I, I told each one of my children, I'd give them a certain amount. You got $50 worth of phone calls. And after that, you got to pay for them yourself. Mm-hmm. So I got yeah, this yeah. idea. Long distance was against the rules. Oh, Absolutely. You had to call in long distance. You wasn't calling. You if it wasn't home. 647, you ain't calling. You ain't calling. Call call mm-hmm. No. And um, I had an uncle that had a house right on the point where Bell South and Blossom Telephone started. So I called Bell South. And I says, I put a pole up, 20-foot pole, dug a hole, put a pole in the ground on the Bell South side, one foot from Blossom. And I called Bell South. And I said, put me a phone on that pole. He said, well, what do you mean? I said, that's your line right there, ain't it? He said, yeah. I said, put me a phone on that pole. He said, okay. So he put me a phone on there. I went and bought 5,280 feet of telephone wire, (laughs) hooked to that phone right there, dug me a ditch to my house, put me a phone in. How did, did you get a ditch witch at least? I got a ditch okay, witch. Okay, I was fixing And to I say. went down that holler, got studded in the creek, and had a flat tire, and had to put the tire on my back and towed it out of there. <laughs> towed it out of the creek <laughs> yeah. because. You know that creek goes down there? Oh, way? yeah. I got I got a flat tire down there in that creek, and I took it off of that ditch witch and put it on my back and towed it out of there and got it fixed, went back down there and my put it back on there and come back out of there. Pure determination. That's determination. That is. I had saying, some happy kids and a happy wife. I bet you did. <laughs> that is saying. <laughs> I have a problem and I'm going to fix it. <laughs> I did it. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. That line's still in the ground, believe it or not. No way. Yes, it is. Yeah. I, do, I learned this. Someplace I'd lay it on the ground. Rabbits love that underground cable. Oh, like the insulation out of it. That's true. And uh, uh, the trick to that is to hang it up in a tree where a rabbit can't get it. Just go when, up the when you tree. Can't, when you, you're you going down a steep bluff and you can't dig it, yeah. just hang it up on a tree limb, you know, and the rabbits can't get it and they'll leave it alone then. Yeah. One of these days, somebody's going to dig that up and say, what on earth is this? <laughs> but now we have record of it. You got a record of it, but I can show you where it's at. <laughs> we got the YouTube video to prove it. <laughs> I was telling the guy at church the other night, <clears throat> I said, you ever heard party lines? He said, what? I said, party lines. He said, well, what are you talking about? I said, man, when I was in Vietnam, my mother didn't even have a telephone. He said, you're kidding. I said, no, we didn't have telephones when I was in Vietnam. Yeah. And I said, what they set up was a two-way radio thing, thing uh, CBs they call them. And I was on Gardner's Hotel one night. And what we would do in Vietnam, you would call this telephone number there, and that guy then would call somebody in the United States that had a CB. And he'd say, this guy's wanting to talk to somebody in Birmingham, Alabama. Here's their telephone number. That guy, say, in Arizona would call my aunt in Centerpoint. And he said, will you take a long-distance phone call from me concerning your nephew that's in Vietnam? And my aunt said, yes. Okay, we're going to patch you through. While they were doing all that, take about an hour to set it up. They called me one night morning, 1 o'clock. I was on Gardner's building there in Vietnam. He said, we got your phone patched through, and here's the way it works. You say hello to your aunt and whatever you want to say to her, and then you say, over. And when she hears you say, over, 
Well, she'll tell you something and you say over. And that way, this guy here knows how to flip the switch back and forth so you can talk to her. And about, it's the only time I got to do it in three years I spent in Vietnam. I got to talk to my aunt one time and I asked her how my mother was doing. And uh, so, the, uh, so over meant to switch over yeah, he, to the he, line. He, 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 I guess he undone the microphone switch and knows, okay, this girl's talking now. Now he's talking, do this right here so he, she can hear him, you know. And I got to talk to my aunt for maybe 15 minutes. Another war story, but my mother was. Eight months pregnant when my dad got sent to Normandy. Mm. He was there. Uh, he got there two weeks after initial invasion, and Dad didn't talk about that much. But I asked him one time. I said, well, "What was it like?" He said, "Well, son, all the bodies were gone, but said all the equipment, you know, destroyed us there." Well, he uh, he got uh, wounded about five days after he was over there, and uh, I said, uh, <laughs> "What happened, Daddy?" And he said, well, "Son, they." Uh, Sent five of us after a German tank. I said, what did you think? He said, I thought, the day I die. We had rifles and that's the tank. What do you think I thought? And uh, they didn't make it to the tank. Something happened. But the story I'm going to tell is uh, my mother had her first child on August the 22nd. Two days later, the guy from the Hayden Post Office, well, Banger Post Office in, drives up in the yard in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. Gives her the telegram. I said, Mama, what do you think? She said, Well, son, the mail had run that morning. He come by. I saw him when he came by. But said he came back that afternoon and says, They don't never make two trips. And said, He handed me the telegraph and said, There my baby was two days old. And I thought, mm-hmm. Mercy. Mercy. I got chill bumps just hearing you talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's but, a letter but I would want to open. Mm-hmm. I was telling you about the guy, about the party lines. He said, How did that thing work? And I said, man, you'd have a phone. I said, you'd have two long rings. I'd have a long and a short. And I said, the phone went ring, ring. I knew not to answer. That was your phone call. He said, what kept you from listening to my phone call? Not, not a thing nothing. in the world. Not <laughs> Absolutely nothing. I, I said, sometimes they'd get on there and say, get off the phone. My child's been hurt. I got to call a doctor. And I said, you can hang the phone up, you know, let people get on the line, you know. But he had never heard of nothing like that. That was the one thing I did. Obviously, I didn't live during the party line days, but the one thing that I've always heard about the party line is don't say nothing on the party line that you don't want everybody to know. Yeah. Yeah. We uh, we didn't have phones till uh, Now we got Facebook. (laughs) (laughs) Don't say nothing on Facebook that you don't want everybody to know. Is that improving or not? I don't know about that. I don't know. But I thought, so this is interesting to me because I have thought, Oftentimes, about you know the men that that built America, the men that that raised me and raised my my parents, and they and you, we've heard this said before. They just don't make them like they used to, right? Mm. But but when you really think about it, they really don't because again, the mental strength that you would have to have. And maybe even the faith that you've got to have in the good Lord to just know he's going. It's going to work out. He's 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 in control anyway. This is all going to work out because some things you just can't control. That you you know we carry these phones around in our pocket. We we got a little sense of security, but really we can't control a lot of stuff anyway. You know, mm-hmm. it, we, you just get the news faster. Essentially, I, I saw about getting older. It just makes you think different. But <clears throat> my mother, I think she was 17 years old when she married my dad. And he, he went off to basic training. Before they got married, he went to basic training. And then come on basic training, they got married. And then he got sent to South Dakota. Well, my mother was working for the restaurant. And I guess that's where I got my restaurant thing. You know, she worked at a restaurant down in Birmingham. <clears throat> she said, I should be beside my husband. I shouldn't be down here. Yeah. She wrote her mother and daddy a letter. Said, when you read this letter, I'll be on a train going to South Dakota. I'll, I'll be gone. Wow. And she, just, I said, Mama, why didn't you call? She said, we had no telephones. And said, I wrote him a letter and said, when you read this letter, I'll be on a train to South Dakota. To Don't my, try to talk place, me out of it. <laughs> my place is beside my husband. And, you know, you come back to what you said. What if your 17-year-old daughter said that? I would lose my mind. Yeah. I, 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 it but, baffles my mind to think about some of it. 
here's not to get off into, I guess, conversation about this, but those men were put in a different environment that forged them. Yeah. We're not <laughs> in that environment. You know, that 17 year old young lady that you're talking about and a 17 and, and no offense to anybody out there. This is not an offensive statement. She had so much more life experience before th- at, at 17 yeah. right. mm-hmm. than, than they did. It's just, and that's not just girls. That's guys, that's everybody. Mm-hmm. So you're talking about, you can't even compare today to then. I, my, my grandson just turned 19. He graduated from Mortimer Jordan last year and uh, he's going to uh, up here at Wallace State. He's studying nursing and uh, <clears throat> he turned 19. And I told my wife the other day, I said, think about this, Sherry. Can you visualize our grandson in Vietnam? No. And I went there at the age of my grandson. I thought I was a man. Mm-hmm. And I don't know where it was or not. But it'd make you one in a <laughs> hurry. Make, oh, yeah, it'd make you grow up. <laughs> make you it? grow up in a hurry. But I can't I can't fathom my grandson at 19 being in a place like Vietnam, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and back to your point, I think it's a guy named Brokaw said that the World War II generation was a, the, the greatest generation. I'm not going to argue that point. I think the generation that raised them, because mm. you think about it, my dad was born in 1919. When the Great Depression came, he was in 29. He was 10 years old. My dad at 10 years old could see what his dad was doing to survive during those Depression years. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you use the word forge, I think that forged a lot of character, Integrity, mm-hmm. principles, and standards Resilience. to live your life by, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, I, yeah, and I don't, I don't know what we're doing that today or not. But I like to think that clearing a jungle off down there at a barbecue pit, working, <laughs> working uh, 15, 16 hours a day. I, I got some of that from my mother and dad. Work, work ain't gonna kill you. It ain't gonna hurt you. No, no. no. They told us in the army, pain won't kill you. It says your body will go into shock and. You'll start laughing or something like that. Now, what caused the pain may kill you, but the pain ain't going to kill you. Work ain't, people are lazy nowadays. Yeah. I guess you can do it better if you don't take it. No, I'm not <laughs> But I would like to go, I want to stay with the years you just talked about. So let's talk about Hog Mountain growing up. Give me some a story or some stories that forged you working with your dad, working with your granddad. Just take me up there and... Give me one of those great memories that you got from that helped you get where you're going. Two people influenced my life. My dad, my mother, completely different though. Mm. My dad was a guy, it's black and white. Mm. I never will forget this. It used to be a thing called cotton allotment. You've never heard of that. Mm-mm. You were depending on how big your farm was, the government would say you can have like four acres of cotton. That's all you can raise. Can't raise anymore. You yeah. can't raise no more. Well, cotton allotment man would come out and measure your field to see if you had four acres. And he came out to our field one day. And my mama told me, and I wasn't about six years old. So son, go out there with a the cotton allotment man and show him where the cotton's planted. And I went out there. And the guy started measuring it off. He said, you got too much. Pick up some rocks. Let's go down through here and place the rocks down through here and tell your daddy he's got to cut all that down. Well, dad came home and uh, mama told him, well, that didn't go good over my daddy. My daddy says, I had peanuts there last year. Same thing. You had an allotment, four acres. You can plant peanuts. I plant peanuts on that field last year and they said it was four acres. I plant cotton on this year and it's not four acres. Tell me how that works. He went to the office in Aniana. He told that man, he said, I didn't know God could make land grow. (laughs) He said, but that land has actually grown up there. There's more than four acres up there. It was four acres last year in peanuts, but there's more than four acres in cotton. He said, I just can't believe this. My point being, hey, this is the way it is. My mother taught me wisdom. Hmm. Oh, but uh, uh, pick cotton, pick a load of cantaloupes before you go to school in the morning. Plow a mule. <laughs> you don't know nothing about plow a mule, neither do you. No, I was going <clears> to <throat> ask you if you ever had to plow with a mule. Man, kind of life. I've plowed a mule. Me and my brother plowed a two horse turning plow. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's got a double single tree and two single trees on it. We was plowing that thing, got hung on a rock. And I told my brother, said, that the single tree was about to break. I said, we make these mules pull hard enough, that single tree will break. We'll go to the house. We'll go to the house. 
good Lord says, no, it ain't going to break because you ain't going to have nothing to eat if we don't grow this stuff. That ain't how it we're going to work. It. And we tried for 30 minutes to get that single tree to break, and it wouldn't do it. And I told him, just pull it out from other rock. Let's keep on plowing. And uh, How old were you then, you think? Oh, 12, 13 years old. Plowing with a mule. Plowing with a mule, 13, 14 years old. You had a good plan, though. But the good Lord said, no. Nah. Uh, no, nah, he wasn't going to let that single tree break because he knew, but man, you, if you didn't. Uh, if you didn't work, you didn't, you didn't eat. You didn't, you didn't eat. Work. That's, that's true. That's let me, true. Let, let me tell you a saying that my, my dad has taught my seven year old son. And he got it from uh, a guy named Foxy. I don't even know what. I can't remember Foxy's last name. I'd like to meet him. I would like to meet Foxy, right? <laughs> so he, he tells. My son, he says, it's like Foxy's daddy taught him. If you don't work, you don't eat. If you don't eat, you don't poop. And if you don't poop, you die. <laughs> Shame of events. And my son goes around saying that. And I'm like, son, son don't. Like, that, everybody need, nobody needs to know that, right? Yeah. So, but that's, that's the chain of events, right? You have to work in order to eat. And they taught you that at a very early age. And the good Lord was watching out for you because if you weren't there to plow it, if you weren't there to put the, put the plow to the ground, it, they weren't going to raise no crop that next spring, were you? Tomatoes, cantaloupes, cotton, peas, stuff like that. And one year we had a crop and dad came down with kidney stones. And me and my brother... It was left to us and mama to try to keep everything going, you know, and we couldn't. It was just getting behind us. And this is something you don't see nowadays. And one day, uh, one weekend, one Saturday, the uh, community came in and gave us what to call a working. And all the farmers came in with their mews and their plows. The women came in to hoe, and some of the women cooked meals that day. And it was it was amazing. It was a, we plowed our whole about twenty or thirty acres that day, and the community came in. And it is it, actually the day my dad got out of the hospital with a kidney stone and stuff like that. That's it. Just had an impression on me. Now it had an impression on me on some sense that I'd never be a farmer. Mm-hmm. Now I I did say this. We talked about barbecue a little bit while ago. I'll go back to plowing you before I go back to barbecue. Okay. Learned a good lesson there then, didn't Boy, you? Boy, that's hard work. <laughs> I admire people that's in the restaurant business, but people think, man, they, they're they just raking in the money. That is hard work. I don't care what kind of restaurant it is. It yeah. is hard work. Did you ever know Jake Washburn? <clears throat> sure did. He tells a story. He was talking about that uh, plowing with the mule, getting Caught on a rock. He was uh, plowing on. He was on a tractor though. This was l- after he had finally got a tractor. He used to plow with a mule, but he would. He tell used to testify in church, and he would talk about he'd be out. He was out there plowing one day, and every time he'd go across the field, his disc or plow would hit this rock. And uh, he said, about the second time he did it, he said, ah, "I'm sick of that rock being in the middle of my field." Well, he picked it up and he went over there. And his neighbor's fence line was right there. Well, he just tossed it over on his neighbor's side, you know, just, just as good place as any, right? And he said he got back up on that tractor, and he said the good Lord just beat him over the head for the next hour, you know. you I can't believe you'd throw a rock over there on your neighbor's side. And this, going back to integrity, he finally had to, he was like, good Lord, I understand. I, I got you. I've got Roger. you. I, I, I have learned my lesson. I hear you. He had to stop his tractor, go over there, pick the rock up off his neighbor's side and throw it back on his side. But but that's the kind of stuff that, that you know, that type of integrity, those that those moral values that that are valuable in people's lives that only come from people with wisdom like your mom and, 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 and because it made his job easier, you know, he was a lot easier not having to run over it, but that, that integrity he learned not let him, he had to go over and get it tore it. And the, the, the bad thing was he had a new pair of overhauls. He tore his new pair of overhauls going over across the fence <laughs> to get it to come back across. And he said, salt in the wound. That was a little salty. So well, I learned my lesson there. My, my grandfather, on my daddy's side, <clears throat> he had cancer real bad. And my grandmother had a stroke when I was about 14 years old. And uh, uh, they had to have somebody live with them for a while. But at 14 years old, I'd go spend Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday nights with my grandparents <clears throat> and get up in the morning, come back and get on the school bus and stuff like that. But <laughs> my daddy, you could hear him plowing in the mule. He'd get mad at the mule. 
And you hear Jack Green. I don't know if y'all know Jack Green. He goes mm-hmm. up on the rich side of the mountain too. He's a fine gentleman. But he'd be hollering at his mule. And you could actually hear him in the field. My Back daddy, and forth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. My daddy had a famous saying. You black buzzard, you you ain't <laughs> worth the gunpowder. It would take to blow your brains out. <laughs> talking about the mule. You know? And the thing about it is, somebody else would go up there and start plowing that mule. That mule just, just, plow, just, just, just plow as straight as you can. But huh? they, know they're, they know who's plowing them, buddy. They know who's plowing them. That's daddy funny. would holler his. Jake would holler his. Yeah. Jack would holler his. You know, they're, they're all in the field plowing. You know? <laughs> that's that's you know, what was going on on the mountain? Oh that day. man, you know what's going on on the mountain. <laughs> Everybody's plowing their mules. But work ethics, man, that, that, that taught you work ethics. Because uh, see, your daddy go take fifty baskets of tomatoes to the market, come back and dump them in out to the hogs. He wasn't bringing anything. And he said, mm. "I ain't gonna give them away. I'll just feed the feed hogs." The hogs with them. <sighs> when I was about, I don't know, twelve, eleven, he said, "We're gonna build a fence today," and I thought. You know, I'm strong, healthy. I'm going to outwork this old man. Because, I mean, he was, I mean, he's in his 70s, you know, and still in good shape, but whatever. We didn't get halfway across the holler, and I was laid over on the bank. I said, oh, Papa Hayes, I, it's getting hot, boy. It's getting hot. And he's got on his overhauls, long sleeve shirt, straw hat, and just working circles around me. And I'm the one that's in full health and full of life. And so it's just a different generation, a different person. It, uh, I wouldn't take anything in the world far being raised the way I was raised. I don't know where I want my children and grandchildren to be raised that way. I want them to have the principles and all that kind of stuff, you know. But, man, that, that, that of course, <laughs> we didn't know we were poor. We didn't. We didn't know that, you know. And we thought, man, we we we're doing, doing great, you doing know. Fine. We didn't know any difference, you know. We'd go to Miss Ellis's cafe up there at Cleveland Yard, that, that little cafe up there. You'd get a cheeseburger and a coke for twenty five cents. Twenty five cents, you'd buy a cheeseburger and a coke. First job I had was in the. <clears throat> I was a senior in high school, and my uncle had a barber shop there in Cleveland, where the little lawnmower place is at. And uh, I went down there and shined shoes. I was a shoe shine. How much boy. did you get for shining a pair of 15 shoes? Fifteen cents. Fifteen cents. Yeah, while they're getting a haircut. How long did it take you to do it? That while they're getting a haircut, you you thirty actually, minutes. No, no, were, yeah, no, nah, maybe twenty. You got this little stand. You take up there, you know. You put the shoe down there, and you'd polish them, wash them, polish mm-hmm. them, and go to the other side. You know, time they got the haircut, you'd have the shoe shine. Sometimes they'd give you a tip, give you a quarter. Yeah. I thought I was rich, man. You could go get a cheeseburger to coke. <laughs> I just said, hey, you could. You thought, man, this is great. This is great. And nowadays, people don't even take a change no more. Hey, you can keep that change. I don't want that change. If it ain't a dollar bill, I don't want it. Just keep it. I do that nowadays. What's use having carrying kind of change around your pocket? Ain't worth nothing. Ain't worth totally nothing. different. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't take nothing for it, though. Man, I wouldn't take nothing for that, but I don't want to do it again. But... Uh, Oh, man. So you come back from Vietnam. How did you get into law enforcement? Uh, I started flight school, learned how to fly airplanes. And uh, the way the VA worked or your GI Bill worked, if you started college, it pays so much, you know, a quarter or something like that. Well, in flight school, flight school is so expensive, you'll spend all your money in about a year. And I'd been flying, oh, I've been trained about six months, I guess, and my money was getting pretty low. I told my instructor, I was going to have to uh, do something. And he said, well, go become a police officer. And uh, and it turned out he was a police officer. Hmm. And uh, he said, go down there and take the test. And uh, when they hire you, tell them you want to work night shift. And so that way you can still fly in the daytime, you know, go to school in the daytime. So uh, at that time, nobody wanted to be a police officer. You go down and take the test every week. Really? Yeah, oh yeah. I took Was it. Was this Birmingham or Jefferson County? Uh, you take it on the civil service system, uh, Jefferson County, and they they the one that hires for Birmingham and uh, just about all the police agencies in Jefferson County. And I took the test four times. And after I took it four times, I knew the answers to everything. You know, you finally take the test, you master <laughs> that thing. And uh, <clears throat> one day the who, uh, Homewood Police Chief called me and uh, he said, hey, you want to go to work here? I said, yeah, I sure do, man. And uh so uh, I started working in work night shift, and I still learned how to fly. And uh, I transitioned after I got my commercial license for an airplane. Uh, 
Jefferson County started talking about getting a helicopter. And there's a helicopter school up in uh, South Carolina. I sold a little advertisement for them. And uh, they said, we'll teach you how to fly a helicopter in a week. And I thought, that ain't possible. In a week? Yeah. Uh-huh. And flying an airplane, you can fly maybe one or two hours when you're training. Most flights last for an hour. But after you've been up there for two hours, if you're really doing stuff, you're tired. And uh, I called them. I said, man, I said, two hours on an airplane is about all you take. Oh, no, man, we'll fly three or four hours a day. And he said, you you transition to a helicopter in a week. And I told my flight instructor down in Birmingham about that, and he said, you can't do that. I said, well, they say I can. He said, well, I don't think you can. I said, okay, well, I'm going to try it. <laughs> I'm going to give it a shot. So uh, I drive to Saluda, South Carolina, and uh, Marvin and Merv Himbel, H-I-M-B-E-L was their names. He had a little barn out there, and he had three helicopters. <laughs> Marvin out there. and Merv Himble. Yeah, and uh, that stuck with you. <laughs> he uh, had three helicopters out there. You know, M- M- Merv. Merv was my flight instructor. He was an ex Piedmont airline. You probably never heard of that airline. Mm-mm. It used to be used to be an airline called Piedmont. He was a retired pilot from Piedmont Airlines. He was my instructor. <clears throat> First day we went up, man, we flew for about three hours. It wasn't tired at all. It, it was fun. It was really fun. And uh, you, was, you was always learning something, you know. And uh, this, is a, this is a scary story. There's a thing in a helicopter. You come up to that bottle right there. That's a tree. Three feet off the ground. And they teach you your tail rotor does not need to get too slow. You know, it has a reverse effect. If your tail rotor gets too slow, the whole helicopter starts mm-hmm. doing it. So they teach you <clears throat> teach you that maneuver. Go up to that tree right there, get three foot off the ground, lower the tail speed on your rotor, and you have to start compensating with a pedal on the helicopter to compensate for the low speed. Mm-hmm. And finally, you'll run out of pedal, and they'll tell you how to get it back up. You drop, cycle it, turn some throttle in. Big deal. I learned that. He said, okay, let's go do something else. So we go up to about... Five, six hundred feet. And he said, okay, stop the helicopter. What do you mean? Stop, just stop moving. Hover. Okay. Hover. Hover thousand feet. So I'm gonna teach you what it is to get get in your own downwash. The helicopter will get in its own downwash, start going down. All you gotta do is fly out. He said, I'm gonna show you that. And he said, so hover thousand feet. I hovered. And I was concentrating. He said, Don't let it move now. Don't go forward, don't go sideways, all that. I let my tail rotor drop. The whole helicopter did that Ooh. about three or four times. Mm. I screamed like a, <laughs> oh, man. I screamed. I turned everything loose, and he grabbed it. I mean, Thank he gra- goodness. Oh, he grabbed the collective and the uh, thing here, you know, and got a hold of it. And uh, I know that uh, I, I was whiter than those lights right there. Oh. He said, do you know what happened? I said, no, man, what happened? He said, Exactly what we've been trained on. You let the tail rotor get too slow, man. And said the helicopters, you know, for every action, there's an equal opposite action. And he said, that helicopter started doing that. And he said, you, you got to watch your tail rotor. I said, well, I'll watch my tail rotor. I'm going to watch my tail rotor for Watch my tail rotor, buddy. What controls the, is there a separate throttle for the tail rotor? No, or? It's just a, you just have to keep the throttle up. And when you start pulling power, well, power takes something off the tail rotors. Well, you got to give it more throttle, or you give it m- more of the pedal on. You know, you got everything working. You got this working, this working, throttle working, and you both your pedals working. It's not like I always said this: flying airplanes like riding a bicycle. You'll never forget it. You'll never forget it. Hmm. Helicopters different. It's like standing on a ball and trying to bounce on top of a ball. You, you, you lose that. You have to. I did. I you have to. I had to learn that. But I, if somebody crank up an airplane day, I'd fly. It. It's that easy. You just get in. It's easy. It's easy. It's easy flying an airplane. Well, what did the, you finish in a week? Yeah, yeah. You were I, trained in a week. Yeah. What? What? I had a commercial license in an airplane, and then you just transition over to a commercial license in a helicopter, so you don't have to build as many hours. I think I had to fly maybe twenty five or thirty hours in a helicopter and learn these maneuvers. They give you a flight test. But one of the humble guys, the guy that I think Merv is the one I flew with. Marvin's the one that owned it, I believe. I may have that back. But every time <laughs> Marvin come in, he turned the motor off. In the air. And he landed in the parking lot like that right out there. Not as big as that out there. They say, here comes Marv. 
All Here of a comes. sudden, boom, motor goes off, man. He come down and set that thing down. He went and crush an egg. Man, he could set that thing down on a dime. But you can do that, you know. You just auto-rotate. Pull power in right before you hit the ground. Boom, set her down. And it's, it's great. It's, it's fun. But uh, I'm not a big fan of heights. <laughs> huh? <laughs> uh, no, a, because when, when it goes wrong, though, it goes wrong real real yeah, bad. It can go wrong. Yeah, it went wrong with me one time. But they, they put a tire out there back this table right here to tell you put the front of the strut in the center of that tire and go all the way around that table and let the strut get out of that tire. You I asked the guy when he was going to let me solo, and uh, he says, when I can stand outside, grab a hold of the strut, and you walk me around a square, and me hold into the strut of the helicopter. And one day, we oh, we flew about two or three days, and he says, well, let me out. Once I get out, bring the helicopter up three feet, let me grab a hold of the strut. He says, I want you to walk me around that square out there. Walk around, that, and he waved at me, take off. I'm the brave man. And uh, wow. they got come back. Yeah, man, that's fun. Yeah. How did you apply the the helicopter training and back to life? I went there because Jefferson County was going to get a helicopter. They thought they were. They finally did get one. And but Mr. Tom Glore, the county commissioner, told me, Bailey, you will not have a helicopter as long as I'm here." And he didn't get one as long as Mr. Glore was chairman of the county commission. What do you have against <clears throat> helicopters? Huh? What did he have against helicopters? I don't think it was had anything against helicopters. It had something against Mel Bailey. I, I understand. I think, it I was think. a personal yeah, relationship. I think it's politics. Yeah. Uh, but I joined the National Guard, and I belonged to a helicopter outfit out there at the airport. And we had a golden opportunity. You can get military, ex-military helicopters. And Jefferson County finally got one. And uh, one of the deputies I worked with was uh, – a former military helicopter pilot. And we went to Sheriff Bailey and said, hey, let us fly your helicopter. If you're going to get one, let us do it. And uh, politics. Mm. They put a man in charge of it that uh, didn't even know how to fly. Sounds well, that right. makes total sense. <laughs> it sounds about I went right. flying. He called me one day. He <laughs> says, uh, just Sam, like what you doing? Jefferson I says, uh, would do. I ain't doing nothing. He said, I want you to go with me. And he was, he was a... Uh, he might have had his pilot's license at the time for a private pilot. But we uh, we went to South Alabama that day and picked up a lady and then took her to Huntsville. And we're coming back at night. And it's different at night when you're flying. It, it's a lot different. And we got to the airport, and he couldn't see the runway. Mm-hmm. And you, you basically go in a square, downwind, base leg, final approach. We were on downwind leg. He said, I don't see the airport. I said, man, the runway's on your left. It's on the left. We're on the downwind leg. Downwind leg. I don't see the airport. I said, turn on base. Turn on base. Man, I don't see the runway. Oh, my goodness. Turn on final. <clears throat> turn on final. It's in front of you. The runway's in front of you. Like the lights weren't even on. They were on. They were on, and uh, they, just but, weren't, they just weren't on in the pilots. Uh, mind. Yeah, they weren't. He, did, he, he didn't get it, but <laughs> did he land safely? He landed safely, and he ended up flying the sheriff's helicopter and everything. That's funny that you talk about the, not being able to find the runway in Birmingham. Daryl came over to the house the other night, and he was talking about flying through Birmingham one night, and he was coming through there, and he said he called the tower to tell him he was going to pass by, and they said. Uh, no, we'd like for you to come approach the like you're going to land and then go fly out of the approach. And he said, "No, uh, I, I really need you to let me just go. I know how I know how to get through. Just let me get through." And he said, about the time he said that, his instruments went off. Like mm. the lights went out on his instruments, and. He said, I really need y'all to just let me fly through. And they said, no, we've got planes coming in. You need to fly the approach. So long story short, he he turned and headed towards the runway like he was supposed to. And for some reason, they turned the lights out on the runway. Just turned them out. And he so he's like... He's got lights out on his instruments, lights out on the runway. He had no idea what was going on. He was like, I, I don't know what's going on. He said he has never been more scared in his life. So somehow or another, he I guess he told the tower. They get him get him back going. I think they were just 
messing with him. They turn the lights back on. He gets out, and he's so flustered. He flies up. He said, you know what? I'm just going to fly up 65. I know where 65 is. I'm just going to fly up 65. So he flew up 65, and he got off on the wrong exit. He got off on uh, Walker's Chapel Road instead of Fieldstown Road because he was, like, he was just following like he was in a car. <laughs> His instruments was out, so he was like, "I'm, I'm just gonna figure out how to get here by flying the interstate." He goes up, he puts it, he lands somewhere on uh, in Walker's Chapel, somewhere over there. He had to land to get his bearings right, and then he's like, oh, "Okay, I know where I'm at." Goes back up in the air, and then goes to the hangar where he's supposed to be. I could not imagine how crazy that had to be. Was he? He was in a plane or a helicopter? He was in a helicopter. That's because he just sat down where he won't tell you. That's what. And that's the only thing that saved him. He said, "I was just able to find the empty parking lot, sat down, and was like, okay, where am I at? Figured out where he was at, picked back up, went over and where he was back supposed to, to Birmingham. Be. It's different at night. It's different. It sure is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Oh, Daryl. Oh, Daryl. Oh, the Daryl story. I get him. He needs to come back on and tell that he one needs to, He does need to tell that. I can just see his excitement in it. Yeah. Or feel it, you know? I came home from Vietnam first time. Boy, this is, this is a tearjerker. Me and my mom were sitting at the table. I said, Mama, did you pray for me to come back? Nope. Never did. Said, Whoa. Well, what do you mean, Mama? You didn't pray. She said, look out that window right there. Look at the rain. She said, you see that path going down that barn down there, boy? I said, yeah, I sure do. Every day, I walk down that path. I told the Lord, your will be done. She says, son, if I had prayed for him to bring you home, he'd have sent you home in a, in box. a box. So I said, Lord, your will be done. Mm. I said, I ever prayed right for you there. one time to come back alive. I thought, good Lord of mercy. I know that you will bump the store. Good, <laughs> great, Mr. Chester. What are you doing? Uh, yeah, that's safe right there. Are, bringing the power boy, out. Boy, uh, that'll, that'll make you humble, boy. That'll make you humble. I remember my dad got the big idea when we was about, I was uh, 14 years old. He went up to Illinois and went to work, public works. He wasn't going to be no farmer no more. And he actually decided he's going to move his family up there. And we moved there. Illinois. Illinois, mm-hmm. Erie, Illinois, right in the top left-hand corner, Illinois. And uh, we lived up, uh, upstairs, right next door to the fire station. And me and my brother and my, my sister was a baby at the time. And one night, my brother and I heard something, and we thought somebody was breaking into the house. I told Junior, I said, man, something's going on. Let's, Daddy worked a night shift. And... Uh, I said, let's go see what's going on. We got out on the bed. <laughs> we started crawling across the floor towards our mother's room. And uh, we kept hearing it, kept hearing something, kept hearing something. We kept crawling, kept crawling. Got right to my mother's door. My mother was down on her knees praying. And uh, she was having a hard time, hard time up there. You know? Living and, in Illinois. Uh, I thought... Uh, Praying. She was telling said, the Lord all about it. She was telling all about it. It wasn't about a month that uh, we come back home. Come back home. The Lord worked that thing out, too. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Daddy decided yeah. he's going to be a farmer well, after uh, all. Huh? My grandmother and granddaddy got in real bad health. They had to come home and take care mm-hmm. of them, you know. And uh, it worked out good. It worked out good. But uh, I thought, Mama praying at night, you know, just her and the Lord. Man. Yeah, that's yeah, that's what it's made of, buddy. That's what you gotta have. Nah, that's what you mama. gotta have, buddy. Yeah, you yep. have all the money and all this kind of stuff. But you better you better get that part right. right yeah, if you got a praying mama, you've got gold. <laughs> a lot of folks don't have. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to tell one to close <clears throat> us out. It has to do going back. Just we're gonna take two steps back to the corn, and then so I thought of corn, and I thought of you, and I thought something is bringing a memory back. You invited Gerald Huffstutler and I to go to the corn maze. Yeah. It was so in Locust Fork, they had a huge, I don't know how many acres of corn that was. It was big. a big one. Big. So they had a huge stand of corn and they cut a maze out in it and you could go down there. Well, you told me you wasn't going to leave work early. You wasn't going to knock off the, the, the Sherry's Creekside barbecue. You said you'd be here at eight o'clock. 
and we're going to get in the truck and we're going to go to Locust Fork and we're through this corn maze and you handed, you showed me the card. Somebody had taken, you know, back then, today would be a drone, back then it was a helicopter, and had taken a picture of it. And you had spent the time to figure out, it te- you're talking about planning, and that's what, I, so planning corn and you came together in the story. And you had got a route on that thing and you said, boys, we're going to try to get through this thing in less than eight minutes. And I looked at that corn maze and I said, Mr. Chester, I don't know about that. He said, be here at eight o'clock and we're going to, well, we got there. You, you were so excited. <laughs> and you, you, I think you paid our way in and you paid our way in and you had, you, you had a flashlight, that postcard, and we started and you were just, it was like we were back in Vietnam or something. You were leading us through the jungle and it was a left and a right. We got to go over this bridge, boys. And we were just, and we were back out. And when we walked back out, the lady that took up the money said, how did y'all get out so fast? And we were just like, we're with this guy. Hey, this he, guy's the one we had had the Man, you had it down to a pad. But that was, I'll never forget. That was just one of those core memories that meant something to me. That, that And I know to you, it wasn't a big deal. But you invited us to go, took us over there, and that was just that was, was just fun. good. That's yeah, good that was your hustle. Don't leave me. Don't leave me. I remember mean, it was like that. Don't leave me. <laughs> well, you were basically me. sprinting through the entire thing. So. <laughs> well, you must have been quick because Gerald was one of the fastest one around here now. That boy could fly. Hey, he didn't want to get lost that hey, night, He didn't want to get lost yeah, in yeah, the corn maze. That. I remember old Gerald. Don't, don't leave me. Don't leave me. He's the quickest, he's the quickest person I've ever met. Yeah. yeah, he goes zero good to man. sixty in a fa- in a man. hurry. Zero. No, I've never seen. I don't know anybody that could beat him in ten yard race. Mm-mm. Now they may get him at twenty or maybe yeah. forty. You ten know, yards, you will get him. He taught me a valuable lesson in life. We'd do something wrong down at the barbecue place. He's Mr. Chester. We ain't done nothing. We can't do over again. Think about that. Hmm. We ain't done nothing we can't do over again. That's if true. we messed it up this time, we'll Try make it right again. the next time. That's but right. we ain't done nothing we can't do over. I'm gonna have to start using that one. Yeah. He, he's and your line of work, it'll yeah. apply quite often. That's exactly right. He, we ain't done nothing we can't do over again. Yeah. We've talked a lot about work and dead today's today's work, yesterday's work, and uh, it's been good. I've enjoyed it. I have too. I appreciate you coming out and uh, spending a little time man, with us. Just spending some time and taking us back. I'm ready to go to work. I've told Mr. Chester, he's got me all charged of where we're going tonight. We've got to go get in a job. Yeah, hey, if we you, had a corn maze to go yeah, to, you might yeah, lead you through you're, it. You're only working 40 hours a week. You're a lazy man. You heard it here first. Yeah. Heard it here first, buddy. The Lord, well, the Lord didn't rest but one day. What you doing doing, doing too? You just sound like Randy Fallon. Man. <laughs> he told me the other day, he said, Dang, a Saturday I ain't worked in about 35 years. I said, Amen, brother. Let's get you after it. You believe him too, don't you? I believe him. And I believe you because every time I go by your property down there, something that, that skag or what, whatever kind of lawnmower you got, hey, just going down open. through doing something. Hey, yeah. Idle that. hands is the devil's workshop. There you go. Say. I don't and like I wintertime. You been can't a work. Of that. Can't, we can't work that mm-hmm. much in wintertime. But it, uh, the daylight's coming. Uh, see, my mama says, come day, go day, God going to send Sunday. Just hang in there. Yeah, he's going to send it right on. <laughs> you you believed in that day of rest when you're working six days, <laughs> yeah. don't you? we definitely going to rest today. <laughs> you know, we want to take just a second to thank our sponsors of the Hayden, Alabama podcast that make this all possible. Uh, we want to thank Precision Graphics. Again, uh, they, anything that needs to be printed, you guys can turn to them. That's precisiongraphicsinc.net. Also, Island Law here in Hayden. Uh, we appreciate Whitney and, and her sponsoring the show. Uh, West Blunt Lawn and Tractor. And so if you have any sort of Husqvarna needs, you check them out at uh, westbluntlawn.com. And then also um, Thermal Hunting. So the hat that I have on, we appreciate those guys. Got a lot of hunters in our, in our podcast audience. Uh, so y'all check them out if you have any sort of a thermal night gear i'm pretty sure they've got something to meet any need you have so check those guys out we appreciate them helping us out with the show well we're gonna rest this episode of the hey now podcast i'm philip i'm shane i'm chester we'll see you next time <laughs>